Situation. Old Mexico is ripe for conquest. Mission seize land, resources, and native peoples. Execution lead 500 well-trained Spanish conquistadors. Administration in the name of the King of Spain. Command and control, Captain General Hernán Cortés. Welcome to Conquerors. I'm Captain Dale Dye. Nearly 500 years ago, Spanish conquistadors began their conquest of the Americas. The most successful of them all was Hernán Cortés. When Cortés and his men first landed in Mexico in 1519, they carried weapons like this, finely tempered Spanish swords. The people he faced, the Aztecs under Montezuma, were still using relatively primitive weapons, like this obsidian blade. Now, Obsidian is sharp, but it's very fragile. No match for Spanish steel. Just as importantly, the Aztecs often didn't use their obsidian weapons to kill their enemies. Sometimes they used them to wound or capture an enemy so he could be used as a slave or a human sacrifice. Both sides, Spaniards and Aztecs, thought their weapons would bring them victory. April 1519. The Spanish mission to conquer Mexico is in big trouble. Its leader, conquistador Hernán Cortés, is facing mutiny from his own troops. They want to end the expedition at Veracruz and return to Cuba, but there's no turning back for Cortés. And he'll make it impossible for any retreat by committing one of the most daring acts in the history of conquest. He burns his own ships. Now, the only option for his soldiers is victory or death. And victory depends on the leadership, diplomacy, audacity, and cunning of one man, conquistador Hernán Cortés. Cortés was born into a poor family of lesser nobility in the Extremadura region of Spain. He was trained by his father in swordplay and horseback riding. Cortez's formal schooling included the study of law and diplomacy. He had a bit of university education, and in fact, among the conquistadores, he's probably one of the better educated people. Cortez knew that he must leave his homeland to seek the fame and fortune he desired. He took his chance alongside other Spaniards sailing to the New World. Why do people do all of this? Not because they wanted to make a three-month trip across uh, the Atlantic in very poor conditions, but they want to make wealth. In 1504, 19-year-old Hernán Cortés landed at Hispaniola, a Spanish colony now known as the Dominican Republic. At age 25, Cortés became a friend of a well-known conquistador named Diego Velázquez de Cuellar. Cortés joined Velázquez in his conquest of Cuba. The natives on the island of Cuba were no match for the Spanish army. In the early 16th century, the Spaniards were the most effective military force in all of Europe. By 1511, Cuba was conquered and Velázquez became its first governor. Those who came with him, including Cortés, were rewarded with land on the island. Soon, Velázquez made Cortés magistrate of Santiago. He was not a very wealthy man, but one of the most important people on the island of Cuba. On behalf of the King of Spain, Velázquez sent expeditions from Cuba to Mexico. The first expedition left in 1517. These conquistadors returned with gold, slaves, and stories of barbaric native people who ritually sacrificed humans. A second expedition departed in 1518. When the leader failed to return on time, Velázquez ordered a third expedition to Mexico. Cortés mortgaged everything he owned and volunteered to finance the trip himself. Velázquez, in turn, named him the Captain General. Finally, the great opportunity that had lured Cortes to the New World was his. This was his chance, and he'd gamble everything to make it successful. 
Cortez's ambitions were fueled by stories of the great Aztec Empire. He felt certain this empire held all the riches of the New World. He'd seize this land and become as rich as a king. He'd be known and respected by Spanish society. Cortez feverishly prepared for his new endeavor, and Velazquez worried that Cortez would not be the lapdog he'd hoped for. Velazquez hoped to maintain control of that expedition and hoped to be in charge as governor of any new territories that were found. Cortez, from the very beginning, uh, had no intention of respecting Velazquez as governor of Cuba. Of course, to control the expedition, he had to control Cortez. And that turned out to be more difficult than Velazquez imagined. Velazquez sent an official government messenger to let Cortez know he was being relieved of his command. Cortez had the messenger killed. In response, Governor Velazquez ordered local officials in Havana to stop Cortez. But Cortez had become a hell of a recruiter. Every man Velazquez sent to detain Cortez ended up volunteering supplies, cash, and often himself to join the expedition. 18 February, 1519. Without official authorization, Cortez set sail from Cuba with 11 ships and over 500 men. He'd sail west toward the island of Cozumel, an established landing for Spanish expeditions. By defying direct orders from Velazquez, Cortez took the fate of the expedition into his own hands. But his difficulties seemed to give him a sudden faith, a certainty that he was destined to succeed. Cortez was a man unlike any other. When he was faced with a problem, he developed a series of strange capacities. First as a man of war, then as a statesman. He developed strange capacities. In other words, he rose to the occasion. And that, folks, is what conquerors do. Cortez would have to adapt and overcome. He'd have to rely on unknown and untested allies. He'd have to develop a savagery comparable to this untamed land. And he would have to take on a more mythic foe than any conquistador had ever faced. Born around 1466, Montezuma became emperor of the Aztecs in 1502. Descended from royalty, Montezuma inspired his people through fear rather than affection. His people worshipped him as a deity, and common citizens were not allowed to look directly into his eyes. Cortez had set his sights on Mexico, but to conquer Mexico, he would have to conquer Montezuma. In February of 1519, Spanish conquistador Hernán Cortés landed with his fleet at Cozumel, Mexico, on the Yucatán coast. Though he wasn't the first conquistador to land on these shores, he was the best armed. Cortés brought the most cutting-edge weaponry available, including cannons. Cannons are light. They're probably not the Lombards they brought. These are falconets, light, breech-loading artillery. Cannons like these were small but effective. Not only did they tear major holes in native formations, but they scared the hell out of them. They didn't have gunpowder in the New World before Cortez got there. So on the battlefield, a weapon like this was a distinct physical and psychological advantage. The conquistadors also carried a matchlock musket that shot a solid lead ball. Not very accurate, but deadly at close range. Another specialty weapon was the crossbow. Now a crossbow like this could fire a bolt out to an effective range of 100 yards or more. Cortez had special units of conquistadors who were assigned just to load these weapons. And he had other units assigned just to fire them. With these weapons at his disposal, Cortez met members of the Mayan tribe. These Mayans told Cortez where he could find a Spaniard named Aguilar. Several years before, 
Cortez's expedition, there was a shipwreck, and one of the surviving members, a man named Aguilar, uh, was taken captive by the Maya and learned Yucatec Maya. And when Cortez's expedition came along, they realized that he could translate for them from Maya into Spanish. With Aguilar on board, Cortez sailed around the Yucatan coast to the Mayan town of Potanchan, arriving there around 22 March, 1519. The natives of this town had given gold to the leader of an earlier Spanish expedition. Cortez hoped for a similar reception. The chief stalled for three days, ignoring Cortez's request to come ashore. While the chief prepared for battle, the Spaniards were forced to sit on their ships and wait. Now, Cortez was tired of waiting for an invitation into Potonchan. He readied all his men and their weapons, the crossbows, the muskets, and the cannons. But for sheer innovation, shock value, and usefulness, nothing beats these next two secret weapons. And this was Cortez's first secret weapon, a bull mastiff. Trained to kill and often outfitted with their own suits of armor, war dogs were shocking to the natives. They'd never seen dogs trained to attack men. Cortez's other secret weapon was the horse. He was the first Spaniard to bring them to the New World. Now, he only brought a dozen or so, but on the battlefield, they made all the difference. The natives thought his horses were dragons. On the battlefield, that was a distinct psychological advantage. The Mayan warriors were no match for the modern conquistadors on horseback. They thought the horse and rider were one divine being. The native peoples were terrified of the horses. They had never seen anything like it before. Cortez followed with the firing of his cannons. The Mayans were frightened but continued fighting. Then Cortez ordered a rear flank attack and the bloody battle came to an end. Cortez then collected his spoils of war. In defeat, the natives of Pontanchan brought Cortez gifts of food, gold, and most significantly, 20 women. These included one woman the natives called Malinale or Malinche. The Spaniards would christen her Doña Malina. Her language skills would prove invaluable to Cortez and his conquest. She joins the ranks of the Spaniards as a sexual object. Only she has a great advantage over the other women. She knows Nahuatl and Maya. Doña Marina knew the languages of the Aztec and the Mayan empires. Cortez suddenly had an important tool of conquest, the ability to communicate. Through Aguilar, he could speak to Doña Marina. And through Doña Marina, he could speak to the Aztecs. With his newfound translators on board, Cortez pressed on. He decided his march on Montezuma should begin further north. So in April 1519, he sailed across the Gulf of Mexico to present-day Veracruz. At Veracruz, Cortez met natives forced to pay taxes to the Aztec Empire and to Montezuma. Cortez immediately was aware that these people were not happy. And so he had an inkling that perhaps this empire was more vulnerable than he had thought previously. This vulnerability was good news for Cortez. He would have to exploit every weakness to take down Montezuma. Included in Montezuma's empire were over nine major ethnic groups. The emperor had a firm grasp on the Valley of Mexico and his power spread out from there. When the Aztecs first came to the Valley of Mexico at the end of the 12th century, they were a band of people without a home. Their gods instructed them to build their new home on the site where they saw an eagle sitting on a cactus with a serpent in his mouth. Modern-day Mexico City occupies the spot where Montezuma consolidated his power in the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan. Built as an island in the middle of a lake, the city appeared to be as impregnable as it was beautiful. The Aztecs emerged as an empire in 1427. They only really began their major expansion in the mid-15th century. And as they expanded out, they had a series of peoples they had overcome. To control his empire, Montezuma had spies everywhere. 
He'd been tracking Cortez since the Conquistador landed in Mexico. This sort of intel was critical. Montezuma needed to know every shifty move this Conquistador made. Knowing the Spaniards had a great lust for gold and gems, Montezuma sent an emissary with gifts for Cortez. Montezuma hoped these gifts would pacify the conqueror. He pledged continued gifts on one condition, that Cortez stop his march and not come to the capital, Tenochtitlan. The emissary reported to Montezuma that Cortez was coming anyway. He told him that Cortez wished to pay tribute to the great Montezuma in person, and he would bring his army of conquistadors, their guns, their loud cannons, their immortal horses, and their demonic dogs. On paper, the Spaniards should not have been a threat to Montezuma. Cortez had an army of barely 500 men compared to hundreds of thousands of Aztec warriors. And yet, Montezuma feared Cortez. Cortez had arrived during a season when the Aztec calendar didn't allow Montezuma to wage or even prepare for war. Because the Aztecs really went to war from early December until April during the dry season uh, after the harvest. So he hadn't raised the armies, retrained the armies, stored all the food. He wasn't prepared for war. In addition, Cortez had arrived during a sacred year on the Aztec calendar, the year when the Aztec god called Quetzalcoatl was supposed to return. An ancient prophecy foretold that the bearded and feathered god Quetzalcoatl would return on a ship from the east to take back and rule the land of the Aztecs. Cortez came from the east. He was bearded and he arrived in early 1519, roughly equivalent to the year and date in the Aztec prophecy. Montezuma thought Cortez was a god. Montezuma thought he was immortal, that he couldn't be killed. That was a weapon even Cortez couldn't have dreamed of. By August of 1519, Cortez and his men were camped less than 200 miles from Tenochtitlan. Montezuma and his lords debated their next move. There were councils held in Tenochtitlan about what to do, and there was great division within the ruling elite. Should they go down there and just watch? Should they send an army and drive them back into the sea? Should they trade with them? No one really knew. Half the nobles of Tenochtitlan were adamant about fighting Cortez. They believed this brazen Spaniard should be dealt with swiftly and violently. And the final decision was Montezuma's to make. So far, Hernan Cortez's conquest of Mexico was going very well. He'd suffered minimal casualties, and he'd acquired translators to help him communicate in country. But he might have another problem, mutiny. Many conquistadors were surprised to learn that their expedition would continue inland to attack Montezuma in the capital. Many of them talked openly of rebellion. When Cortez decided to go inland, half of his men you know, were protesting and wanted to go back as per the terms of their engagement. So Cortez came up with a plan to keep his troops in line. Cortez established a settlement and legally created the town of Veracruz. He then made himself governor of this new Spanish colony. As governor of Veracruz, Cortez would no longer report to his superior Velazquez. Cortez had removed a link from the chain of command and now he answered directly to the king of Spain. The next part of his plan was much more dramatic. Cortez has the ships burnt off the coast and scuttled um, so that men can't go back so that he can maintain his force um, in order to carry out the victory that he so desires. But this action also cut Cortez's ability to resupply his army. It was a drastic step for any commander to take. Cortez had secured the cooperation, if not the loyalty of his men. To legally secure his position, he sent a ship to the King of Spain. That ship would deliver Cortez's personal letters, gold, native artifacts, and precious gems. And so all of these things, along with the money, are used to essentially establish him as, uh, instead of a rogue uh, conquistador, as a legitimate one. The crown will then support him. 
Cortez then designated a rear guard of 150 men to remain at Veracruz. This ensured no other expedition of conquistadors could encroach on his claim. While Cortez politicked, Montezuma launched a counteroffensive of the supernatural sort. He sent his most talented magicians to Veracruz to drive Cortez and his army back into the sea. The Aztec mysticism didn't work. Cortez and his army marched up the coast to Sempuela. There, he began a shrewd campaign to recruit native allies to augment his small force of 300 conquistadors. At no point in the conquest did the Spanish forces constitute more than 1% of the fighting forces. In the summer of 1519, Cortez made an alliance with the ruler of Sempuala, a man the Spaniards nicknamed the Fat Chief. The Fat Chief felt Montezuma's taxes were a burden on his people and he was glad to hear that the conquistador intended to conquer Montezuma and he was honored when Cortez asked for his assistance. The Fat Chief promised his support of Cortez's objective to take Tenochtitlan. In order to show that support, he gave Cortez a very important gift. 400 native porters, and that brings up an important maxim of warfare. Amateurs study tactics, professionals study logistics. Logistics is the answer to everything in Mexico. Someone's got to carry all the powder, all the shot, all the bolts for crossbows, all the shot for uh, muskets. It's a huge logistical challenge. And the Spaniards can't carry all of that. They have their own loads. With his new transportation department, Cortez was ready to continue the trek to the Aztec capital. The path Cortez selected was a difficult one. The Spaniards slogged through the rainy season in mud and then across barren lands near a large salt lake. Cortez's next stop would be Tlaxcala, home of the Aztecs' greatest rivals. Though surrounded by subjects of the Aztec Empire, the Tlaxcalans remained independent. Cortez sent a message to the chiefs requesting a meeting. The Tlaxcalans rejected Cortez's overture. They answered with wave after wave of their best warriors. The strategy wasn't very effective against the artillery of the Spaniards. The Spaniards, given their weapons and tactics, couldn't always take the offensive. They were too few, but they were very good at taking the defensive. They could withdraw into themselves and hold a very small perimeter and the advantage the Spaniards had is their weapons could penetrate the opposing line every time. The artillery also caused native warriors to panic. Their confusion made them easy targets for mounted conquistadors. With casualties climbing, the leaders of Tlaxcala called a halt to the fighting and invited the victorious conquistador into their city. With his team of translators, Cortez proposed that the Tlaxcalans join his army, and a deal was struck for a united march against the Aztecs. This alliance was a brilliant strategic move. The Tlaxcalan were the biggest and baddest that old Mexico had to offer. They fought in large formations, and in addition to obsidian blades, they used weapons like this. Now this is called an atlatl, and this device is used to add impetus, power, and speed to a spear when it's launched. Now, Cortez took the Claxcalan and he integrated them into his own army. He had his conquistadors trained side by side with them till they had a well-oiled fighting machine ready to go. After three weeks of training and a little R&R, &R, Cortez and his combined army left Claxcala on 12 October 1519. Nearly 1,000 Tlaxcalan warriors joined the Spanish force. They'd see their first action just 25 miles away in Cholula, the last major city between Cortez and Montezuma's capital. These are the remains of Cholula. This great native city had been an ally of Tlaxcala, but was now firmly under Aztec rule. Montezuma ordered the Cholulans to attack the Spaniards and kill Cortez. But Cortez's Tlaxcalan allies discovered the plot. Cortez decided to launch a preemptive strike. Shortly after entering Cholula, 
Uh, there's a massacre in which a few thousand people are killed. The surprised natives were no match for the conquistadors, especially with their new Tlaxcalan allies by their side. The Tlaxcaltecs had allied with uh, the Spaniards, didn't necessarily trust them, didn't necessarily know if they were allies, and part of their demand for this alliance was go down and massacre these people. News of the massacre spread quickly. For the Spaniards, it began a pattern of using terror as a weapon. I think he's sending a message. If you're with us, you're fine. But if you're against us, watch out, because we're coming at you. By the 1st of November, Cortes and his army were ready to leave Cholula. With Tenochtitlan only 50 miles away, Cortes took the direct route, marching his army right between two ominous volcanic peaks. At sunrise, the Spaniards looked out over the Valley of Mexico. There isn't a city in Europe that is even half as large as Tenochtitlan. So it's really a massively impressive city to them. Very sophisticated, very well organized, and they've never seen anything like it. The words of Bernal Diaz del Castillo, one of Cortez's soldiers, captured the feelings of the Spaniards when they first saw the Valley of Mexico. Diaz wrote, When we saw all those cities and villages built in the water and other great towns on dry land, and that straight and level causeway leading to Mexico, we were astounded. Indeed, some of our soldiers asked whether or not it was all a dream. Just nine months after he'd left Cuba, the heart of the Aztec Empire lay beneath him and Cortes gazed out at the riches, the gold, the buildings of this great capital. He could see his prize. Now, he just had to win it. November 1519, Cortes and his conquistadors began the march into the Valley of Mexico. So far, Montezuma had sent magicians to drive the Spaniards away. He'd ordered the chiefs of Cholula to assassinate Cortes, and he'd tried to bribe the conquistador to return to Spain. Those efforts had not stopped the Spanish juggernaut. Time was running out for Montezuma to determine who or what Cortes was. So Montezuma consulted the Aztec calendar, his gods and his priests to try and answer this question. Montezuma decided to receive Cortes as the representative of a great king, as a diplomat rather than as an enemy. He allowed Cortes and his men to ride into the city of Tenochtitlan. Here in the courtyard of the Hospital de Jesus in Mexico City, a marker denotes the location where Cortes and Montezuma first met. The meeting was treated with all the pomp and circumstance of a royal event. With Doña Marina on hand to translate, the two leaders greeted each other formally and exchanged gifts. Now, Cortes was finally face to face with the emperor of the land he wanted. What's going on in the minds of these military men? Had Montezuma just let the ultimate wolf into his hen house? And what about Cortes, surrounded by a quarter of a million Aztecs? And he just walked into the largest ambush in military history? These are the archaeological ruins of the Templo Mayor, the great temple of Tenochtitlan. A week after the Spaniards arrived, Montezuma proudly took Cortes to this sacred site. The Aztecs believed human sacrifices ensured the pleasure of their gods and made the sun rise each day. Cortes and his men were horrified. The Spaniards found this religious practice barbaric. They sacrificed men, and they showed the heart, still beating, warm, to the sun. The conquistadors were frightened. They begged Cortes to take them back to the coast. They were convinced Montezuma intended to sacrifice them all. Cortes shared their concerns, but he was unwilling to abandon his prize, so he made a bold move. He befriends Montezuma and then essentially takes him captive as hostage 
um, and forces Moctezuma to go along with it. According to Cortez's own accounts of this incident, Montezuma went along willingly. But it seems doubtful that a man born to rule would be comfortable as a prisoner in his own home. Montezuma is in a tough position. We don't really know what is going on in his mind. Uh, the accounts that we get about what's going on at this time are written decades after the conquest. Next, Cortez issued an order to halt the sacrifices. Crosses and Christian icons were placed in the temples. His men destroyed all of the Aztec idols and scrubbed the temples clean of blood. Then, at the end of April 1520, a new threat to Cortez arrived. An arresting party made up of 900 conquistadors landed on the coast. The captain of the arresting party was Panfilo de Narvaez, one of the biggest and nastiest conquistadors on the entire Spanish roster. Under orders from Velázquez, Narvaez was to find Cortez and hang him. Rather than wait for Narvaez to find him, Cortez decided to be the aggressor. In May of 1520, Cortez left just 120 conquistadors to hold the capital city and its captive emperor. Cortez raced east with the rest of his army. Cortez races down to the coast, meets them, talks to them and convinces them with money that they should join his enterprise and become entrepreneurs with him. That he has found much more wealth than was available in Cuba, that that wealth uh, will make them very comfortable in life and he is willing to buy them with all kinds of special deals. On 28 May 1520, Cortez launched a surprise attack against Narvaez. The battle was fierce, but Cortez quickly got the upper hand. The men Cortez had paid off switched sides in mid-battle. By dawn, Narvaez was wounded and captured, and his army had joined Cortez. But back in the capital, a new problem was developed. The Aztecs were preparing for a sacred feast. In observance, the Aztec citizens made effigies of their gods and beat ritual drums to celebrate. The man Cortez had left in charge, Pedro de Alvarado, didn't understand what was happening and he interpreted the behavior as threatening. He believed the Aztecs were preparing a surprise attack on the Spaniard. Surrounded by a half a million Aztecs, Alvarado panicked. He pulled his troops up around the three gateways to this courtyard and just opened fire and killed many, many, many people. Alvarado and his men slaughtered all of the nobles and priests. Then the conquistadors killed any Aztec citizen within reach. Cortez received word of the massacre. He was told that Alvarado and his men were alive but surrounded. The conquistador rushed back to Trastitlan with his reinforced army. It was a shock to Cortez and his new conquistadors when they found they had to fight their way back into the city. What followed was organized urban warfare. The conquistadors and the Aztecs fought throughout the city. Warriors fell on both sides. The Aztecs would celebrate their dead and then immediately return to fighting. The Aztecs employed their own form of psychological warfare. They used ritual drumming and rolled severed heads down the street to harass the trapped and exhausted conquistadors. A frustrated Cortez forced the imprisoned emperor to try to pacify his people. What happened when Montezuma addressed his people is one of the most controversial events in the history of Mexico. According to the Spaniards, he's out there trying to calm people down and his own people throw rocks at him, hit him in the head, and then he dies a few days later from those wounds. Other people say that the Spaniards stabbed Moctezuma to death and so there are two conflicting stories to the same event. Was Moctezuma killed by his own people when they rejected his authority, or did the Spaniards do him in after they realized he was of no use? Regardless of how it happened, the result was the same. Montezuma was killed. And a bad situation was getting worse for Cortez. To save his life and the lives of his men, he had to find a way out of Tenochtitlan and fast. Now, here's some tips for conquerors from Hernán Cortés. 
Don't neglect the politics. Make alliances when and where you can. Quickly determine and exploit your enemy's weakness. And a secret weapon gives you an ace in the hole. It was the end of June, 1520. Wary of a final assault, Cortez divided his troops and plotted several escape routes out of the city. With Aztec gold in hand, the conquistadors set out. When Cortez's army had nearly made it across the causeways, an Aztec citizen sounded the alarm. And within minutes, the Spaniards were surrounded by countless war canoes. The panicked Spaniards tried to run, but the Aztecs came along in wave after wave. More Aztec war canoes kept appearing. There was retreat, confusion, bedlam, death. Everywhere, conquistadors and horses were being pulled into the lake and drowned. Cortez lost half his army, along with thousands of his native allies. The retreat of the Spaniards from Tenochtitlan is known as La Noche Triste, the sad night. It should only be the sad night for the Spaniards. It's the happy night for the Indians. I mean, it should be a date to celebrate because they defeated the Spaniards. Once outside the city, Cortez and the surviving members of his expedition gathered beneath what is now called the Tree of Sorrows. Here, Cortez showed his true mettle. He challenged his tired and disheartened troops, calling on their reputations as men, as Spaniards, and as conquistadors. Cortez vowed that they would return to Tenochtitlan and be victorious. Cortez and his troops retreated to the safety of an allied city. They'd recoup, rebuild, and prepare for a final assault on Tenochtitlan. Now, Cortez realized he had to control the lake around Tenochtitlan. Using native labor supervised by a Spanish shipbuilder, he had many small, swift vessels built to counter the Aztec war canoe. While his armada was being built, Cortez decided that a victory over a local tribe would boost the morale of his troops and re-establish him as a warrior to be feared. On 1 August 1520, Cortez sent a message to the chiefs of Tipiaca, giving them an opportunity to surrender. The chiefs replied, go away or we'll eat you. Two days later, the Spaniards and the Clos Collins attacked and it was another massacre. It highlighted the lethal efficiency of this combined force. What the Spaniards were doing was being used as the spear point that would punch through opposing forces and allow the Indian forces to actually exploit those breaches. The massacre at Tepeyaca showed an ever more determined and ruthless Cortez. Little by little, he became tougher and he ended up being cruel. After the sad night, he was infuriated against Mexico. He was a very tough and cruel man. In the summer of 1520, Hernán Cortés received three very welcome surprises. The first was the arrival of a small expedition of 200 Spaniards who eagerly joined his army. The second surprise was a very large ship from Spain sent by Cortés's father. It carried much needed supplies, including muskets, crossbows, and more horses. The third surprise was a new and unexpected weapon, smallpox, which the Spaniards had unknowingly brought to Mexico. It had already killed tens of thousands in the Aztec capital. Among those killed by the virus was Montezuma's brother, Quitlahuac. His cousin, Cuauhtémoc, became the new Aztec emperor. In the spring of 1521, Cortes and his replenished army returned to the Valley of Mexico. He begins to win allies around the lake, one by one, to come over to his side for the final attack of Tenochtitlan. The siege of Tenochtitlan began. There are only three major causeways that go into this city. 
and the Spaniards built 13 brigantines, mounted a cannon in each one, and basically were able to cut off the city from supplies from outside. The conquistadors and the Tlaxcalans made daily raids into the city. As the Spaniards and their allies fought their way into the city over a three-month period, they started laying waste to all the buildings because if they didn't, they would be attacked from those very buildings the next time they pulled in. During the 80-day siege, Cortez's strategy crippled the Aztecs. Smallpox continued to ravage the population, and the naval blockade prevented the Aztecs from getting food or supplies. Even when the Aztecs knew their city was lost, the Emperor Cuauhtémoc could not bring himself to surrender to Cortez. He was captured while trying to escape on 13 August, 1521. After two and a half years, his mission was accomplished. Cortez was the conqueror of Mexico. The old temples will be destroyed and the new church and municipal buildings will be built right in the very center of Mexico Tenochtitlan. And this becomes Mexico City, the center of this great viceroyalty uh, that is called Nueva España, New Spain. Part of Cortez's philosophy for New Spain was an intentional mingling of native and Spanish blood. A biological alliance was created between the conquerors and the conquered. Cortez himself had a child by Doña Marina, his native mistress and translator. They establish a society wherein the sexual union is part of the base of that encounter, which is totally different from other types of colonization. Cortez had this castle built for him just outside of Tenochtitlan. From this hilltop, he could survey all that he'd won. He was still under 40, but Cortez was the governor and captain general of New Spain. In 1528, Cortez returned to Spain, where he was granted the title Marques of the Valley. Though he was initially well received, his new wealth did not buy him the lasting respect he desired. Cortez does return and finds it very difficult to integrate. He would be in Spanish society, the Nouveau Riche. He has the wealth of any grandee of Spain, but is not able to f have the same social contacts or power or anything else that they, these traditional families have. Ironically, Cortez had to defend himself against charges that he acted illegally in Mexico. Some members of his expedition even testified against it. Despite the conquest and its aftermath, the spirit of the Aztecs lives on today through those intent on preserving their culture. They make dishes using Aztec cooking methods. In modern Mexico City, Aztec dancers commemorate their heritage by performing the rituals of their ancestors. They maintain their traditions, along with some resentment for Cortez. He is a very controversial character. To the Mexicans, he represents that ambivalence, the presence of the destructive European. But he is also the great European warrior, the conqueror. For Cortez, the conquest of Mexico proved to be his greatest achievement. He'd personally won more land and treasure for Spain than any other individual. Aztec gold, copper, and rare gems would be mined for centuries. The native people would convert to Christianity and the entire Aztec Empire would become New Spain. And Cortez would be hailed as one of the greatest conquerors in history. There's no question that Cortez is an extraordinarily important figure in the 16th century. He is clearly a world figure of world importance. Cortez had military experience and was himself quite an effective soldier. He was a talented leader, although rather draconian, and in terms of the conquest, probably the luckiest person who ever lived. For his military decisions, Cortez will always be an object of intense study. He got some lucky breaks, like being mistaken for a god, but each time he got lucky, he had good planning and nerve to back it up. And he had the leadership skills to keep his unruly soldiers of fortune on the paths to glory. Add to that superior weapons, psyops, smallpox, and those all-important local allies, and he was unbeatable. Hernan Cortez was a gambler, a charmer, and a warrior. 
Above all, he was a great conqueror. I'm Captain Dale Dye. Thanks for watching.